This is the Simple Success Fitness Stress Management Masterclass. Today, we're going to understand, identify, and overcome stress to help you live a healthier, happier life. Now, we're going to hit this in a way that you've never done stress management in the past, so make sure you take notes. If you need to, go ahead and pause this video so that you can grab a pen and paper and take notes along because this is going to be so in-depth. If you're ready, let's dive in. What's good, Simple Achievers? Steve Hicks here, online coach for Simple Success Fitness. Today, I have something really special for you. I'm gonna peel back the curtain on my health and fitness rehab program, and I'm gonna show you how we deal with stress management during that program. Now, for those that don't know, the health and fitness rehab program is a revolutionary fat loss program that over 12 weeks is a transformative experience that not only will help you lose three inches off your waist, but will teach you sustainable habits that can keep that off for a lifetime. Most fat loss programs, they, they tend to be a little short-sighted and they work on workouts that will kick your ass and diets that starve your ass to get some really quick results, but ultimately most people lose those results six months down the road. The Health and Fitness Rehab works on sustainable habits so you can keep doing this stuff for a lifetime. And instead of just focusing on exercise and on diet, the Health and Fitness Rehab works on all five pillars of health and wellness. It works on activity, it works on nutrition, it works on sleep, stress management, and support and accountability. And today, I'm gonna show you a bit of what we do in the Health and Fitness Rehab program dealing with stress management. Now, stress management is a, because it's such a big pillar, it gets two whole weeks in the program. Obviously today, I'm not gonna give you two weeks worth of material, but I'm gonna give you the really meaty parts of that. So that when you walk away from this, when you look back on the notes and when you do the work that I'm gonna to recommend today, you really have a solid strategy to live a truly healthy, happy life. But why stress management? Why do we care about stress management? Why do I think it's so foundational when most trainers barely even talk about it? Well, the reality is stress management can have some profound impacts on your health and wellness and also on your fitness. There are some really practical and physiological takeaways that we gain from stress management. You know, talking about the body, talking about the physiology of uncontrolled stress, uncontrolled stress increases your chance of heart disease and heart attacks. Uncontrolled stress also increases your chance of strokes and increases your incidence of stomach ulcers. If you look at the presidents of the United States, you can also see that stress increases the aging process so that we get older faster, right? When people get to the end of their terms, they've aged more than just four to eight years. They've aged decades at a time, you know? Stress also, uncontrolled stress, will increase your cortisol rate, which as a trainer talking about fitness, I care about a lot because an increase in your cortisol will decrease your fat burning and will actually increase your muscle wasting. So you'll become less fit if you have uncontrolled stress. Uncontrolled stress also negatively impacts your immune function and it decreases your ability to fight off diseases and colds and viruses, right? And people that get the common cold in the winter time can't work out, they can't focus on their nutrition, they can't get their good results. So stress management's very important on that front. Also stress management, you know, uncontrolled stress, out of control stress, also decreases your sexual function, which robs you of the ability to have a healthy and happy life, right? But then there's also the practical side. It's not just the physiology of it, but when people are overwhelmed with stress, when, when life is a burden and weighing them down, when stress is out of control, we're less likely to make good decisions. We're less likely to work out. We're less likely to make good food choices and we're more likely to stress eat and emotional eat and, and focus on the foods that are a little bit greasier and not so good for us. And we're less likely to get off the couch and get that spontaneous movement so our steps are too low. You know, stress really can be a wrecking ball on your health and wellness as well as your fitness. So I think it's paramount 
that we manage our stress and we work on stress management. Now, before we start cowering in the corner thinking that stress is the silent killer that's got it out for us and because we're really stressed, we're doomed. That's not the case. That is not the case. Before we do that, we need to address the fact that there's two kinds of stress and not all stress is the same, right? There is gonna be the distress and there's gonna be you stress. Now distress, we obviously don't need to be a master in English literature to understand that distress is bad. Distress is distressful, it's distressing. It is the things that cause our bodies to break down and for our minds to get really panicked. But then on the other side, we have eustress, which is the Greek root eu, meaning for good. There's good stress, right? And there, there are two big factors that separate whether something is good stress or if it's bad stress, right? The first one of those is gonna be magnitude. How much of the stress are we, are we engaged with, right? This is most obvious with exercise. If we think about exercise in the right amounts, you get stronger, you get leaner, you're more flexible, your stamina increases, your physical capabilities go through the roof. You're more flexible. You're able, to, you're able to wake up in the mornings with less joint pain. These are good things. The body improves. The body becomes healthier. The body becomes more, more finely tuned and able to perform. These are great things. But if we do too much exercise, then we start to have muscle soreness or we get some misery we might have some pain or worse, we might cause injury to ourselves. Too much exercise is bad. The right amount of exercise is phenomenal. Exercise can be a good stress or a bad stress based on the amount that you have. We also see this with something as simple as like radiation from the sun, right? If you go out, you get some sunlight, you get some vitamin D that helps prevent rickets. It also helps promote a whole lot of other functions in our immune system, so you're generally healthier. And it also picks up our mood, right? People say that they've got a sunny disposition when they're really happy. And then in the wintertime, especially if you're doomed like me living up north, um, where it gets really cloudy and really dreary and the days are short, we get these things called the Seasonal Adverse Disorder Syndrome, or SADS, and winter, winter gloom, right? We understand that if you get a little bit of sun, it picks us up. And if you get no sun, it's, it's also bad. But we also know, and we've been fearing for the last couple decades, skin cancer from getting too much sun. Too much sun radiation is a bad thing. Getting some makes our body better, but getting too much breaks our body down. And then, of course, we also see this in medicine, right? Vaccines versus viruses. A vaccine is a small little dosage of a virus that allows your body to adapt to that stress, build antibodies, and become stronger for it so you can fight off infection. But if you get too much of a virus, if you get exposed to too much, then your body gets run down. You get sick, you get infected, and worst case scenario, you can die. Right, so there's the magnitude of your exposure to stress can determine whether it's a good stress or a bad stress. But that's not the only thing that separates good from bad. The second thing that separates good stress from bad stress, and this one blows my mind that we can do this, but it's simply our perception of stress. This is why I didn't want you to cower in the corner right away thinking that stress was killing you because our perception of stress can change this. There's some research that comes out of Stanford for the Center of Stress on, sorry, for the Center on Stress and Health. There's research that shows that people that view their health or view their stress differently, they have different health outcomes. They took people that had generally stressful jobs and had them at the same level of stress. So if you ranked your job on a scale of one to 10, how stressful it was, they would pair people based on how they rated their stress at, job, at their jobs, but they separated them based on their perception of the stress. We all know people that love stressful jobs. That makes them feel alive, makes them feel like they're being significant. It gives them a challenge. It's an opportunity for growth. It's a, it's a fun challenge. It's, it's something like almost a competition. It's something that fills people with excitement and they, they seek out these really stressful, high-level jobs because it's fulfilling and they like it. 
And then we also know people that have stressful jobs that are getting broken down, that dread going into work, that just need to complain and feel like they need to drink their job away, right? We, we know there are people that view stressful jobs as just this absolute killer. And earlier we talked about all the negative health outcomes, things like the heart attacks, the strokes, the stomach ulcers, the increased cortisol, the decreased immune system, all those health detriments, all those health detriments happen to the group that view their stress as negative, that view their work stress as killer to them. The people that enjoyed their stress, that thought their stress was a growth opportunity, they didn't have any of those health outcomes. Right? They weren't at a higher risk of heart disease. They seemed to do well with that work stress. Same level of stress, different perception changed whether it was a good stress or bad stress. So knowing the magnitude, how much you're exposed to, and knowing how we perceive it can alter whether your stress levels are good for your body or whether they're bad for your body. So we know not all stress is the same stress. There are good stresses and there are bad stresses. But where does stress come from? Well, there are actually eight sources of stress or eight categories of where stress comes from. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all eight of those categories and then I'm gonna give you an exercise where you identify your own sources of stress within those eight categories because a problem that doesn't get identified cannot be fixed. You cannot manage stress you do not identify. So we're going to use these eight categories to find our stress and then we're going to give you some stress management strategies that are going to overcome those. So the first category of stress is going to be physical stress. And I know, I know, of course the personal trainer is going to talk about physical stress, right? Um, but physical stress is going to be activity plus labor. Right, so activity is really obvious. Those are the physical activities that we engage in. Things like exercise, or if you play any games, or if you go for walks, if you walk quite a bit, that's gonna be a physical activity and ultimately a physical stress. Generally a good stress, but a physical stress nonetheless. But there's also labor. Some of our jobs are a little more labor intensive, and so we actually get some stress while we're working there, right? If you're a mechanic, if you work in construction, if you are a postal worker, if you, if you have anything where you're doing a lot of physical work at, at your work, that can be a physical stress. So your activity and your labor make up the first category of physical stress. The second category is going to be structural. And this is talking about the way your body's made up. Typically, we're going to talk about biomechanics here, but we also want to address injuries and abnormalities. The biomechanics are really easy to think about. If we think about when you're exercising, everybody, everybody has talked to you about using good form so that you stay safe. And the reason why is if you use the wrong form, if you use the wrong biomechanics, joints get loaded incorrectly and they adopt more stress than they can handle and that can potentially lead to injury or distress like we talked about a couple of minutes ago, right? So biomechanics are important. And if you're not sure what the proper form on an exercise is, check this channel out. I've got like 250 different exercise demonstrations available. You can check out the proper form on this channel or you can reach out to a personal trainer and get some guidance on that. But biomechanics is not the only form of structural stress. There's also injuries and abnormalities. In the summer of 2019, I had a catastrophic injury to my left knee where my tibia was actually ripping apart, right? So now I have a steel rod in my knee, three, three screws and five pins. And that injury has caused a lot of structural stress on the body. And as I exercise, that's a continual source of structural stress. But there's also abnormalities, right? That could be a birth defect or even just body weight distribution, right? I had a client that had cerebral palsy and because of the way the body moved with that, he put, he put extra stress on his joints, especially his knees, his back, his ankles, and his wrists had tremendous amounts of stress that we had to navigate and manage. But there's also weight distribution, right? Excess body weight can put more stress on the joints, such as the knees and the ankles and the hips. 
Um, so structural stresses exist. The third category is mental stress. And this one's going to deal more with cognitive stress. So if you think like a student cramming for a final, right? That's a lot of cognitive stress. That brain is getting overworked in that moment. So that can be, that can be a cognitive stress, but that's not exclusive to students, right? If you're at work and you're, you're trying to get ahead or advance your career, that can be a cognitive stress. Or if there's a big project coming on that you're working on, that can be a cognitive stress. If you're learning a new language, just for fun, that can be a cognitive stress. If you see me shift side to side, that's that left knee talking again, talking about the structural stress. Um, the next, so the first three, physical stress, structural stress, and mental stress. Next, there's digestive stress. And this is gonna talk about quantity of food, and it's also gonna talk about intolerances within that food, right? And if we think about quantity, think about like, Thanksgiving dinner, when you eat too much and then you, oh, it's so sluggish. Your stomach rumbles with indigestion. That's digestive stress on the body. And if you pair that with a bunch of other things, it can be too much stress and it can be overwhelming and it needs to be managed. But we also have food intolerances, right? And there's, there's things like, I know with myself, I have a, I have a dairy intolerance. I have a, I have a lactose intolerance that if I get too much da dairy products that still has lactose in it, then my stomach rumbles and I'm really uncomfortable and it's a digestive stress on my body. And it's this, it's going to be an environmental stress on those around me. We'll get to environmental stress here soon. Um, but digestive stress can be another stress on the body talking about quantity of food or the intolerances within food. There's also emotional stress, right? And that's gonna talk more about someone's mental health state, but it can also talk about life situations, right? Mental health, obviously talking about whether people are in a depressive state or if they have high anxiety levels or something else. These are, these are situations in which the body's always up and it's a high stress life, right? So that, that can be a source of stress for a lot of people. And then also life situations, right? Emotionally, we are affected by what happens around us. If someone passes away that's dear to us, that's an emotional stress and that's hard to deal with. If someone we know is really sick, that's another emotional stress and that's hard to deal with. Maybe we lost our, maybe we lost our job at work and now we're, now we're considering ourselves to be a little bit of a failure. That can be an emotional stress. So that's another source and another category of stress, emotional stress. In addition to that, we also have social stress, right? That's going to talk about interpersonal relationships and how we interact with each other. And this is talking about like friends and family. And usually friends and family are a good source of stress, right? They, they tend to be stress relievers. There are things that fill us up. But there's sometimes interactions with them can be stressful, right? If, if you're in an argument with someone or if you're in, an, in a fight with someone, that interpersonal stress can be really stressful. And then how you interact with your coworkers, that can be another, that can be another social stress. So friends, family or coworkers, they can become, they can become social stresses and they're worth identifying. Societal stresses is the seventh category. And that's gonna talk more about how the greater society acts on you or your interactions with the greater society. We see this most obviously every four years with a new election cycle. Every election cycle, there's that stress that gets put on everybody within the system. That can be a societal stress, trying to pick the next leader and making that decision. We can also talk about activism throughout the year or throughout the throughout your life if there is a cause that you feel really passionate for looking at that cause can cause some societal stresses especially if we're dealing with injustices right or if there's a large societal upheaval that can be a societal stress um, in that moment for some people it's a little bit more joyous seeing the opportunity for future justice might not actually be that stressful for us but seeing injustice can be. We also want to talk about socioeconomic status when we talk about societal stress, right? If you're struggling to pay bills, if you're not sure how you're going to pay rent, that is stressful. That is stressful. If you're not sure how to get a job or if you're not sure where the next job is going to come from, that can be a source of stress. 
And then finally, the eighth category is environmental stress. There's a lot that falls under environmental stress. Right? It can, the obvious one's going to talk about toxins, whether your air quality or water quality is really high or whether it's really poor. That can have a big impact on the body and can be a stress on the body. We can also talk about temperature. Temperature can be a stress. People in really hot environments or really cold environments, their body is working harder to survive. That is an environmental stress put on through temperature. We can also get this in noise, right? The noise level in our environment can cause stress for us. If you've ever had a noisy neighbor that you had to shove pillows against your ears to try to go to sleep, you know what I'm talking about already, right? Or if there's like this gentle chirping, some people lose their minds when the birds are chirping early in the morning when they're trying to sleep. Noises in the environment can cause environmental stresses. We also have to talk about light, right? We, we address light earlier talking about how people have sunny dispositions, or if you're doomed like me to live in the north, then the winter gloom can be an environmental stress on you. And finally, in your own little small sphere, tidiness can cause environmental stress, right? I know plenty of people that when, they're, when their room's chaotic, when their house is disorganized and messy, it's a stress and they're demotivated. They're, they're not willing to do other activities because their environmental stress is too high. So those are eight categories of stress. We have physical, structural, mental, digestive, emotional, social, societal, and environmental. What I want you to do next is an exercise where we identify within each of those eight categories what stresses we interact with. And it's okay if you have multiple within one category. That is totally fine. Having more sources of stress does not make you more stressed out. Having sources of stress that you don't deal with, that makes you stressed out. Having more sources of stress does not make you more stressed out. Having sources of stress that you don't deal with, that makes you stressed out. But we want to... We don't just want to identify. We want to do an exercise where we ask ourselves three questions, right? We learned a couple minutes ago that the big separator between good stress and bad stress is magnitude. So we want to ask ourselves the three R's. How can I reduce this? How can I reduce this down to a level that makes it a good stress instead of a bad stress? The second question we know our perception of stress can alter whether the stress is good or bad. We talked about the Stanford research. So after we reduce the stress level, how do we reconsider or pivot to view this as a source of growth and a growth and a, a source of opportunity rather than as a silent killer? How can we view this as potentially good for us versus detrimental to us? How can we reconsider? And then finally, we want to Talk about how we respond. The third R is respond. Now that we've reduced it, now that we've pivoted and reconsidered, how do we respond with what's left over? What I want you to do is pause this video real quick, but do come back, do come back. I got more great stuff for you in a minute. But I want you to pause this video, go through the eight categories, identify all your sources of stress, and then ask yourself the three R's. How do I reduce? How do I reconsider? And now, how should I respond? And if you don't know how to respond, that's okay. Put, I don't know. We'll get to that in the next section. Pause the video, do the exercise, but do come back because I got 12 great stress management tactics and strategies that you can implement to overcome just general stress management. So, you know the eight categories of stress. You identified your own individual sources of stress within each eight categories. And now you've got a stress management strategy based on the three R's for each of those stress sources. But even though you're managing stress on that, you're going to eventually get a small accumulation of stress. And we need some general stress management techniques. Ways that we can melt that stress away and keep you moving on a healthy happier life. So let's get into some stress management strategies. The first stress management strategy is subscribing to Simple Success Fitness. 
No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a bad joke. But if you're not subscribed already, I think you can see there are some knowledge bombs on this channel. And if you subscribe, that means you don't miss out on anything. And we can give you all the tools to live a healthier, happier life. So subscribe if you haven't. And while you're clicking down there, you might as well hit that like button down in the corner so that YouTube knows this is a valuable video. And if you've gotten some good knowledge out of this, please share with your friends and family so that we can help reduce stress all across the world. Now, what I do want to do is give you the real techniques, right? We need to talk about, first, we need to talk about the locus of control. And there are things that are within your control that you have power and influence over. The ancient Stoics, the Romans and Greeks taught us that there are things within our control and there are really only two. Marcus Aurelius said that the all that he can control is his thoughts and his actions. My good friend in the fitness industry, Tom Holland, always talks about there's three things you can control. It's how much you eat, it's how much you move, and it's your attitude, right? And that's going to be kind of your thoughts, and then your actions are food and, uh, food and nutrition, but that's, that's really important. We often get weighed down by things that are outside our control, right? Dale Carnegie told us that we must cooperate with the inevitable. We must cooperate with the unchangeable, right? But some of us, instead of cooperating with it, choose to fight it. And you're never going to win that battle. You can only control that which, was, that which is within your locus of control. Everything else, you merely cooperate with. All the time, people get stressed out because they fight about stuff they have no influence on. It's important to identify what you can control, do your best in, with what you can control, and then merely allow the rest. The second thing I want you to do is learn and practice relaxation techniques. Look, I know you've heard this before, but meditation, tai chi, yoga, these can be great practices. My personal favorite is a cup of tea. Every time I have a cup of tea, I have to stop and slow down. Honestly, it's so I don't burn myself. But that action of stopping and slowing down allows me to relax. And anytime I'm stressed beyond control, a cup of tea melts that all away for me. Some people really like bubble baths. Some people really like aromatherapies. Whatever gets you to stop and relax for a moment is a really important practice to learn and practice. The third thing you can do is exercise regularly. We should be doing this already, but if you ever read the book Spark, the revolutionary new science between exercise and the brain, Dr. John Ratty, he talks about this, how exercise uses the same pathways, the same biochemical pathways that the body uses for stress and anxiety. By exercising regularly, one, exercise is a great stress management technique in the moment. My life seems to change when my heart rate gets above 140 beats per minute. But exercise over the long term retrains the body on how to use those stress pathways because exercise comes up and it goes back down. And then it comes up and it comes back down. And it trains the body how to use those pathways and to come back down. Most people get stressed, their stress pathways go high and they get stuck there and they ride that and they live in that high stress state. Exercise teaches your body how to come back down so that you can come back down to relaxation instead of high stress. And while you're, while you're focusing on exercising regularly, you should also start to eat healthy. Look, microbiologists, enterologists, gastroenterologists, and neurologists are all teaching us that there's a second brain in the body and it lives in the stomach. Your gut is your second brain. And the quality of the food that you eat could dictate the quality of your mood. They've done some fascinating studies and found that people that had highly processed foods tend to be more stressed, tend to have higher rates of depression, tend to have more mental anxiety, but people that had a more whole food approach, had more whole foods, more vegetables, more, more, more lean proteins. These people 
dealt with stress better. They had more vitality. They felt well. And it's part of that second brain, that enteric nervous system. So make sure to eat healthy regularly. And we've also talked about like people that are hangry, right? If you're really hungry, if your stomach's empty, we know that affects your stress levels. So do practice eating healthy regularly. Another technique that you can work for stress management is to practice and focus on time management. Look, there's, there's this thing called Parkinson's law that says the amount of work will always stretch or shrink to the amount of time we give it. And since the advent of smart devices and digital communications, people have allowed themselves to work for longer hours so that we're constantly in a stressful environment and that's weighing down on us. Right? So poor time management is poor stress management. You must learn time management techniques and reclaim your stress, reclaim your schedule so that your schedule does not claim you. You must be the master of your time management. Otherwise, your time demands will be the master of you. And when you do the time management, make sure to put some time in for sleep. 80% of Americans in a recent survey acknowledge that they're not getting enough sleep or not enough quality sleep. And look, in the book, Why We Sleep, Dr. Matthew Walker lays down that there is not a single biological function that is not demonstratively impacted by the quality of your sleep, whether it's radically improved by the quality of it or if it's, or if it's grossly impaired by the lack of sleep. Sleep changes our biochemistry and allows us to respond to stress in a more healthy fashion. So when you're working on time management, make sure to put enough time to get a healthy amount of sleep and to get some good quality sleep. And then while you're doing that, make sure you make time for, for, for activities and hobbies that you enjoy. Right, people? And I'm not talking about Netflix binges here. Sitting in activity is not going to help you with stress management. A couple shows where you engage with that intellectually and engage socially with friends, that's fine. But Netflix binges, poor stress management. What we want are ho hobbies that fill us with joy, fill us with passion, right? We constantly whittle away at our energy stores and we, we empty the cup of vitality that we have. We need activities. We need hobbies and interests. We need passions and joys that refill that cup. So a stress management technique is making sure that you actually engage with your hobbies, right? I actually schedule time where I have to play a video game because if I go too long, I notice that the quality of my work gets really low and I just kind of hate life in general, but hobbies bring that passion back. So make sure to make time for hobbies and interests. And you can also do this with good friends and family. And you'll notice I put a big emphasis on the word good. We all know someone that, yeah, they're mostly a friend, but sometimes they're just kind of more stressed to interact with. Right? We want to find the good people, the people that fill us with joy and vitality, the people that help fill our cup back up and melt our stress away. We want to make a more socially robust life because honestly, you've heard this a million times, we are social creatures. We need social fulfillment. And I don't think people make enough time for friends and family, especially good friends and family, to make meaningful connections. And that can be a great stress management technique is to just spend more time with good friends and family. Something that we spend too much time doing is staying in really stressful, unhealthy situations. We don't do this next technique nearly fast enough. And to reduce stress, sometimes we need to remove ourselves from those situations especially when it's appropriate. We sometimes delay and don't, don't make that change and it weighs down on us. And it's kind of the most obvious and the most extreme example is thinking about a toxic relationship, right? We've seen people in relationships that are just bad for them, but they stay there and it weighs on their mental health and it, it accumulates more stress. When appropriate, 
you need to remove yourself from situations that are overly stressful. This can be in the work environment. If you have a bad management team, you could, you should probably look to try to join another department, another team, or possibly even another company, right? We need to remove ourselves from situations that are not making us healthy and happy. Something that we also need to remove is the tendency to rely on intoxicants for stress management. We never should turn to an intoxicant for stress management. And I'm talking about alcohol, that cup of wine, or tobacco, trying to smoke a cigarette, or even drugs, either marijuana or recreational psychedelics. These are not stress management tools. In fact, most of the time when people rely on these, they build the stress up. There's that momentary pause where we, where it's gratifying and it feels good, but afterwards it makes us worse. Never rely on an intoxicant for stress management. And then finally, the most powerful technique, I saved it for last. And honestly, it's something that people don't engage with quickly enough, but sometimes we just need to seek out professional help. Whether that's a psychiatrist, a therapist, or a counselor, a life coach, someone that can help guide us. In the last exercise, when you were going through the three R's, when you got to the how to respond better, if you got, I don't know, this is the perfect time to talk to a professional. Someone that can help guide you through strategies to help help give clarity and focus and, and help melt that stress away with you. Professional help is really something that we need to look at more often. Engaging with psychiatrists, therapists, and counselors, and life coaches can be something that can radically transform your life and melt all of the stresses away. So all those general stress management strategies, the locus of control, what you can control, learning and practicing relaxation, exercising regularly, eating healthy, Practice and learn time management. Make time for friends and family. Make time for interests and hobbies. Remove yourself from situations that are toxic. Always avoid intoxicants. And finally, seeking professional help. These can all be wonderful stress management techniques to kind of wait, to melt away the general accumulation that builds up regardless of the specific strategies we made in the three R exercise. So I hope this, I hope this whole masterclass has been masterfully wonderful for you and has been really insightful. As I mentioned at the start of this video, this is a part, all of these chopped up into the smaller pieces is a part of the health and fitness rehab program that I have. That is a very holistic fat loss program that builds sustainable lifelong habits for people. And if something like this, this is just one pillar of health and wellness. This is the stress management pillar. There's still exercise, nutrition, sleep, and support and accountability, as well as stress management that makes us our health and wellness. If you want to get in-depth focus like this, then I encourage you to sign up for the Health and Fitness Rehab. I'm going to put a link in the description down below so that you can sign up. It's something I only offer twice or once every other month. It's something I only offer once every other month. So it may, the doors are open right now, but the doors may close soon. Just check on it regularly. Or if working with a coach is something that you want, if you need to learn how to exercise regularly or to how to eat healthy, I suggest you sign up for online personal training and we'll go over stress management as well in the support and accountability that comes with the online coaching. I'll also put a link for that down below in the comment section or in the description box so that you can learn more about that. But I hope this has been wonderful. I know it's been long and I thank you for sticking with me for this long. And if this has been impactful, hit that like button, share it with your friends and family. And you know, stuff like this, when we work together like this, this is how we can live a healthy, happy life. (sighs) Wow. That was a lot of stuff. Right? We went over why stress matters, why it's such a pillar in your health and wellness. We talked about good stress versus bad stress and what delineates the two. We talked about the eight categories of stress and identified different sources of stress 
And then we use the three R strategy, how to reduce, how to reconsider, and how to react and respond to help manage stress. And then we did almost a dozen general stress management techniques to chip away at general stress levels. That was a lot. And if you need some time to repackage and reconsider and come back and reevaluate this stuff, that's totally cool. Come back and rewatch this video as you need to. But I hope this has been really valuable. As I mentioned, this is an excerpt, for more or less, from the stress management components that I put in the health and fitness rehab program. It's a transformative, holistic fat loss program that builds sustainable lifelong habits that makes you happier and healthier. And if you're interested in going through the whole program, there's going to be a link down in the description box. I only have it open once every other month, so it might not be open right now. It is right now at the time of the filming and at the time of the upload. There are spots available, but keep your eyes out open. And if if it's not, and you're interested in coaching through the through the healthy habits and coaching on exercise and nutrition, you can also just sign up for online personal training. And I've got a link in the description down below for that too. But I hope this has been really impactful. I hope this helps you take control of your life, helps take control of your stress, and helps you live a healthier, happier life. And I hope that you're subscribed if you're not already, and that you like this video and share it with friends and family so that ultimately we can reduce the stress that everybody feels so that everybody has a chance at a healthier, happier life. If this has been helpful, if this blew your mind, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you pulled out of this and let me know how you're implementing this. I'd love to hear and I'd love to engage with you. So share with me, let me know what you're doing and I hope this helps. Awesome, everybody have a great day and put this to use so that we can live a healthier, happier life.